I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how we connect multi-scale modeling approaches uh, in MS uh, to uh, building computational communities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about science. I'm going to talk a little bit about software. I'm going to talk a little bit about community. Those are going to be kind of the three themes through my talk. And I'm going to start uh, the conversation with a bit of a survey of a couple of the approaches that have been done to kind of flesh out what we mean by multi-scale modeling. So first, we're going to talk about how we go from how we, how we look at some models that go from axons down to molecules, how we look at models that go, come up from molecules to levels of cells. Now, by the point that I get there, there's still going to be a significant gap. Uh, that's kind of the, way, the state that we are in right now. But we're going to talk about how we address that gap through the creation of software platforms, specifically open platforms that are modular. And we're going to talk about how that also needs to be supported by a community of folks that come together to help fill in that gap so that ultimately we can get to integrated disease models. Okay. So the state of the landscape right now for multiple sclerosis system biology modeling is fairly sparse. It's mostly composed of axon models with various foci in the realm of biophysics. Okay. Um, a truly integrated model does not exist today. The kind that we'd like that would cover all the relevant processes, that's just kind of what we're given right now. But we think that there are really important things that are being done already in the multi-scale world that, um, that help us move this forward. And, and I'd like to t talk to you a little bit about some of those. Okay. So first, axons to molecules. All right, so we know that multiple sclerosis is um, a condition that largely affects the white matter. Um, and we know that the white matter, uh, if we're talking about the white matter, we're really talking about the myelin sheets. And we're talking about the condition where myelin sheets that were uh, there today go away and the way that that affects axonal conduction. So um, uh, Kogan 2011 is one example of a paper that used multi-compartmental modeling to do a, um, a view of what computationally, to play around with the ideas of what computationally you can get when you have a model that first in one condition has myelin and looking at axonal conduction through that, doing ion channel modeling, and then you take away that myelin and what that looks like. So um, the model is able to reproduce conditions that are known to affect axons, uh, such as failed conduction, where you have an action potential that starts uh, on one side but doesn't make it to the other end at all. Uh, you have um, recover conduction where you have an action potential which starts, uh, doesn't show up at exactly this, uh, the right time that it's supposed to, but does make it across. Um, conditions where you have evoked after discharge, where you've got uh, an action potential and then way too many uh, at the end. And cases where you've got uh, spontaneous ectopic spiking, where you've actually, actually got action potentials coming back in the other direction. So um, these are things that you can start to explore computationally under, this, uh, under these conditions with ion channel based modeling so that you can see progression of uh, the action potential under normal conditions or under demyelinated conditions where you're not getting the, uh, as many action potentials as you want or looking at these after conductance compensations. And these kinds of models basically go from what do axons do to uh, what some of the ion channel dynamics are underlying them. Um, but if we look a little bit further at the anatomy of the problem, we realize, of course, that uh, neurons are cells too, and axons, in fact, have a, a rich subcellular set of activity going on. So if we peel away the myelin sheets, of course, those are just cells themselves, we find that there are uh, lots of things that regulate ion channels at this level. And so it's important for us in a deeper understanding of the processes underlying this for us to dig in a bit further. And there has been modeling now going at a, at a, at a, um, at a smaller scale, a smaller spatial scale, that's looked at the EM level to reconstruct nodes of Ronvier. Um, so now we're looking at a, a cutaway of um, uh, myelin sheaths here and an axon running through here and the node in the middle. Um, and uh, this is uh, looking end on at different, uh, at different slices. And in fact, there have been efforts to reconstruct uh, computationally in 3D at a much higher level of resolution. Uh, what's going on in, in this case in a, models that are known as electrodiffusion models. So here, we're no longer representing um, ion channels as elements in equation, but we're actually looking at individual molecules floating around in concentrations. Um, so uh, models such as this, published by Le Priori in 2008, um, actually use finite element modeling to drill into how different concentrations of sodium and potassium uh, during the course of the action potential are changed and are modified. And uh, the key point here is that this is now a jumping off point to get down to what's happening at the, cellular, at the subcellular level. Um, and importantly, these models um, 
need to be reconciled uh, with each other in order for us to be able to kind of cross these boundaries. So the idea is not that you build one simulation that's at the highest level of, of detail, but that you build simulations at high detail where they're needed and then compare them up to models of lower resolution. So uh, this is an example of, of then taking those kinds of cable models, like I, I showed you before, and the electrodiffusion model, which I just showed you, and comparing how action potentials look uh, between the two. One, of course, taking a lot more compute time, one taking a lot less compute time, but now when once you've got to fit together, you can start. This is kind of the link in the chain that lets you cross from one scale to another. Okay. And um, so, as I said, there's, um, there's quite a bit going on in terms of the internals of these cells. So um, that takes us from axons to molecules. Now we want to go from molecules up to cells. So some things that really are not so much the, the realm of computational neuroscience, but now get us to computational biology. And let's look at, let's take a brief tour at what's happening inside computational biology by, you know, by picking one by picking one paper for the moment. And again, um, as I mentioned before, there's going to be a gap, and that's the state of where things are, but let's, let's accept that and, and, and talk about how we address that in the next section. So one, I think, breakthrough recently that, uh, that has come out is a wholesale computational model that looked not just to look at individual processes inside cells, but to try to do its best to combine 28 different um, underlying biological processes together in a single integrated model. We were able to essentially put in a dig digital genome and get out predictions of phenotype, okay? So to go all the way from genotype to phenotype using a model that has a lot of parameters, okay, it's fairly complex, uh, has 28 different uh, cell processes, all the ones listed here, there's literally an algorithm that runs it, um, and combine them together, okay? Seems like an audacious, ambitious thing to do. Um, I, I highly recommend you check out this paper. It came out in Cell, uh, which is also interesting as it's not a typical place for uh, computational output. But uh, so let's look a little bit at what went into it. So it's built on top of uh, knowledge compiled in um, a lot of different resources that have uh, been assembled over the years. So you've got PubChem, you've got Uniprot, you've got DrugBank, um, you've got lots of data that were uh, combined from experiments uh, that were done in, in, in microbes uh, of many different kinds. And, I, and, and of course, this is a prokaryotic cell. And there's a big difference between prokaryotic cell and a eukaryotic cell, and we acknowledge that, that's sort of the gap part. But uh, what's possible at this level tells us where the future is, is going. So what was it, what was it able to do? Um, the level of resolution that it had, you were able to look at the cell go through different phases of the cell cycle, from replication initiation to replication, and then going all the way to uh, dividing. And you're able to track different species of molecules, um, represented as state variables inside the model, over those phases. So you're able to look at, uh, at, uh, to see if uh, the right species are going up when they should be during the part of the cell cycle, or to see if they're going down at the right point, and that sort of thing. And the important thing, of course, is where these models confront the real data. And so um, I think the real success of this model is taking real data that was uh, derived from uh, looking, observing uh, this particular microbe, growing over time, seeing how fast it grew, um, and as well playing around with uh, gene deletion type experiments. So one of the things about this particular cell type is that it's easy to, to genetically engineer, make a lot of mutants, and so they were able, so if you are, claim to have a genotype to phenotype model, it better be able to be robust under conditions where you change the genome and see if that actually affects the phenotype. And sure enough, this, is, this over here on the left is an example of looking at um, so growth rates of, uh, of, the, of this particular organism under different genetic mutants. So every dot here is a different uh, genotype. And the position that it sits uh, tells you what its growth rate is. And this is the predicted growth rate constant. Okay. And so where, um, so wild type was where it was trained here in the middle. And so that's going to sit right on unity as, as it should. And um, as different geno genotypes are um, put together here, they sort of fall along this line. You can see there's a pretty good relationship. Some of the outliers that are, that are seen here were then further explored in the model to understand where there was a difference between the two. And then that was used to better improve the model and also actually make some discoveries about how that, uh, you know, how that genotype was, was working. And then importantly, so that's the growth rate part, and then the gene deletion part, and this is, I think, the part that's, that's um, kind of the most interesting, is that as they looked at taking out different genes uh, from this model um, and comparing them to, uh, to see whether, like, removing a gene was essential or not essential um, for the survival of that cell and comparing that to reality, they got an 80% and 80% match rate, which is, is pretty impressive, I think, for, for any model. And so let's see how, far the, how much further this can go into the future, but this gives you a sense that now we're starting to see, on the one hand, an ability to come down from you know, the activity, the, the, the behavior of a cell, like an action potential, and you're able to come up from sort of genotype to phenotypic type of, of uh, measurements 
course, there's still a gap. But the question is, what do we do about that? And how do we move forward as a scientific enterprise to try and fill that gap? So, um, so what we'd like to see in the future, right? We'd like to see integrated models. We'd like to see subcellular processes of interest. We'd like to have eukaryotic cells with mitochondrial function. We'd like to have them interacting with other processes, right? So it's going to take a lift to get there. We'd like to see you know, myelinated neurons in both the CNS and PNS. We'd like to see models of oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells. Like People aren't working on that right now, right? Uh, we'd like to see models of the immune cells that are known to attack the myelin. And we'd like, to see, um, we'd like to see models of the communications between these cells, specifically between neurons, oligos, and Schwann cells, between T cells and oligos. And all of this is sort of the stuff of fantasy today, but tomorrow may be approachable with some of the underlying foundations of the methods that you see here. But in order to do it, um, I think we're going to have to get a bit more structured about the way that we combine these, um, we combine these results together. So um, we need software platforms that let us do this, and we need them to be open software platforms. So what I talked to you about today was multi, a, a few views of some models that exist at different scales, right? So at different spatial scales, and it obviously combined very diverse, different models, algorithms, a lot of a very different code. Um, it also involved very different time scales, and so the challenge there is that you need to be able to account for the fact that these models are very different and better, very heterogeneous. So um, in order to do that, we need to have pretty robust uh, software infrastructures, and the keynote speaker this morning actually commented on the fact that this is a, a challenge for uh, academia to, to do. So, um, but, so how might we go about doing that? It needs to be open source. Um, and it needs to, I think, rely on some of the standards that are used in industry to, to build modular code that isn't necessarily the purview of scientists, but has been done in industry. Um, it needs to use the best software technologies that are out, and it needs to be upfront about forming a collaboration between scientists in academia and engineers uh, that are kind of more industry-minded. People ask me sometimes, you know, like where I am if I'm if I'm leaving academia or if I'm or if I'm staying in academia. And I think the I think that what I would like to tell people is that like we need to have folks who really have one foot in both, because in order to solve problems like this, we need to have all the benefits of academia, where there's a stimulating environment, there's um, unbound exploration, but we need to have kind of the hard-nosed project management that comes from industry. So um, the challenge comes down to right translating what comes out of papers, like the ones that I showed you, into well software engineer artifacts is hard. And that's where we get to community. And that's why collaboration is such an important and critical part of the enterprise that we have to do going forward. So the basic progression kind of looks like this, right? So there's a physical reality of the biological mechanisms, right? So we sort of look at that with the anatomy. There's, there's stuff going on. And then scientists are needed to look into that and pull out some principles of how that relates to physics, right? How that relates to actual like underlying mechanisms. And they'd write that up typically in papers. And sometimes those in the computational realm actually take that, those observations and turn them into some kind of a code implementation. But we're not done there when we have a code implementation of those physics, right? We need to, um, so I showed you an example of that before, we need to actually turn that into a software module that interoperates and scales on a platform. It's the only rational way that we can start to combine these things together. So we've been working on open source platforms. Um, one of them is called Geppetto. Um, you can check it out at, at geppetto.org. It's very early days, but there's, there's something you can download that is, is playing with this idea of how do we make things that, are, uh, that can be developed independently, but then hooked together into modules. Um, because what's needed is that these different pieces need to be able to integrate uh, with what's there today and what's, and what's there tomorrow. And the basic stack of that uh, would look like this, built on standardized uh, modeling languages. Uh, there'd be a, there's a core framework, and then there are different modules that focus on having these uh, implementations of these algorithms that um, come from a diverse a set of sources, a layer that um, combines these together into a simulation, allow an API layer and a web-based access layer, and then on top of that, apps that let you do different kinds of investigations, like defining a simulation that you're interested out of those pieces, um, to do in silico experiments, to ask questions, and to make predictions. So what we like is models like the ones I showed you today to essentially fit into this platform, or you know this one, fit together into this platform. Um, and so in order to do that, the last piece of the puzzle is um, that we can't just build a software platform and have everybody you know, magically use it, because uh, that's, not, that's not realistic. We really need a community that uh, pulls all those pieces together. And so for that, we have to think about a little bit of social engineering, how to make that happen. We need to think about the fact that there, is, there has to be a research phase where computational sciences are doing data gathering, they're developing models, they have a lot of technological freedom. But we also need to partner those uh, scientists with software engineers that think about this as a problem of requirements gathering, of preliminary, of taking uh, those requirements and turning them into an external product. Define a testing strategy. 
Um, and then there needs to be, so after the research phase, there needs to be an engineering phase where now the software engineers are taking the lead, they're implementing the testing strategy, they're extracting building blocks out of those algorithms, and they're making sure that the platform is robust. And the computational scientists are still important here. The scientists are still needed to provide feedback and crucially uh, ensure that, the, that these tests are in fact valid and that, they're, um, and that they're providing progress scientifically. And both need to combine in a collaboration. So the way to do that, of course, there's, there's the problem that these folks are cut from different cloth. They have different priorities. They, have, they use different tools. They have different methods, focus, background. And of course, requirements are constantly changing and we're constantly learning new things about the biology. So we have to be upfront about the fact that we need to collaborate and we need to, in, and there are practice, there's software that help us do this. Um, some of those have already been talked about quite a bit today. I think even mailing lists go largely underrated in terms of how much, um, uh, how much they can do to bring folks together on the same page. And of course, there's GitHub, which we've talked a lot about as one of the key, I think, platforms of the future of, of doing this going forward. So, um, so this is sort of the combination of the pragmatic approach. We have to have a research phase, we have to have an engineering phase, and we have to have communication going between them. So finally, just to kind of put all that together, so I, I, I've, I've given you just a snapshot of what's there today in multi-scale modeling. I've told you how we can try to move that forward you know, with software platforms, but we can't do it without building out a community that's able to think about this single picture and put those pieces together. These are the pieces from which we have to uh, build integrated disease models. So. Thank you very much.